Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Tennis Channel Inside In on the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. Mitch Michaels from the Santa Monica Studios, ready to recap the Australian Open, the 2023 edition down under. Did not disappoint. And joining me to do that now, a reoccurring guest on this show, a uh, pro himself. You knew him with the long hair and the smooth touch at the net. Now he's been an announcer longer than he's been a pro tennis player. He's Tennis Channel's own Leif Shiras. Thank you for joining the show yet again. Um, it's great to ha- to be aboard, and uh, I appreciate the long hair comment. I'm I'm getting a little thinner. I still can volley a little bit, maybe on the backhand side, but I got to work on the hair somehow. Yeah, I saw an old photo that was circulating the, the web of you playing grass court tennis, and I was like, I didn't know Guy Four played tennis. <laughs> <laughs> well, the grass was more slippery back then. I can assure you that, but. Uh, I could cause guys a few problems because I could serve reasonably big and then I volleyed pretty well. So I, I made it difficult for guys to pass. And in that era, if you came in on a good ball, you could usually get control of the net, maybe finish off with a smash here and there. But it was also the advent of Pete Sampras. Yes. But also Andre Agassi and, and the incredible return game that started uh, pushing guys like me out of there. <laughs> well, I, and, I, and I wasn't really planning on starting here, but I think this could be good as someone that lived it and has been connected to the game so long. There was a quote uh, a number of years ago, Roger Federer said, it's different now when I came up and this is Federer talking, he had to learn how to play so many different styles. And nowadays that doesn't seem to be the case. That was, you know, what he said, is that how you see it as well, that it's more kind of streamlined across the surfaces than ever before? Yeah, I I think so. I think there really was a, a big difference between the guys who played the slow surfaces and the guys who played on grass or even fast heart. You know, a lot of players would just skip Wimbledon. Imagine that. I mean, the draw would be missing, you know, 10 or 15 European clay quarters who just said, I'm not going to play it. And the French Open, maybe it wasn't as powerful an event. A lot of guys skipped that. Um, but I, I think Roger was interesting. He had a conversation with Pete Sampras. And of course, they played almost all the points they played at Wimbledon in that fourth round match that uh, Roger ended up winning. We're serving volley points. Mm-hmm. Many years later, they had a conversation and uh, Pete saying, you know, you don't serve in volley as much. And he goes, yeah, well, you don't really need to. You know, no one else is serving in volleying. So there's not as much pressure on the return and there's not as much pressure to serve in volley. Although tactically, you can see it will work in this era. Maybe not every point, first and second ball, but certainly at the right times. Well, somebody that succeeds uh, in any style is Novak Djokovic. His 10th Australian Open, uh, he wins 10-0 and in finals now, which is another interesting stat in a career full of them. He beat Tsitsipas in the final, was not able to defend his title last year with all the issues that everybody knows about. He wins, dropping just one set along the way. And uh, the Djokovic legend continues the match itself. And we're looking at it, I guess, from the, from the big picture view of what Djokovic has accomplished, but the match itself was pretty tight. I thought Sitsipas gave him, gave him a good match. Didn't, didn't play too reckless at all. Played smart, fearless in his own right. It was just the typical Novak match where he's able to win sets where he's not at his best. And in tie breaks leaf, I've never seen anything like it. He just goes into lockdown mode. He's like that hockey goalie that just doesn't give you anything. It was another master class and in being clutch and really all about what Novak Djokovic is, is just locked down in the biggest moments. Yeah. And that's, and that's what defines the great players. Those players who can separate themselves as an elite man or woman is that they deliver under pressure and and Novak seems to do that. I'm always so impressed by the elite guys like Novak, like Rafa, like Roger, the the big three, I guess you could say that last few decades is that they, they're not afraid of their opponent's strengths in fact they'll go into that strength and roger did that consistently novak did that against Tsitsipas. i mean he went into steph's forehand it seemed to me which is the bigger better shot but novak seemed to have a lot of pace on his forehand maybe was he you know nursing the injury feeling he had to do a little bit more with the ball I was surprised by that and how he was able to ultimately gain advantage yes it was maybe not his best performance but like you said found a way to win, made the tactic work and, uh, you know, impressive performance again. Yeah. He was striking the ball so clean and so crisp, very flat on the forehand side, got a lot of depth, which, you know, we can get into all the analytical stuff of it, but it's, as you said, like that, that point is so great that he's not afraid to go at your strength. Even when he plays Rafa, even on clay, he'll give him a go at his forehand. While some players might be intimidated by what the opponent's best shot is, he's not going to back down. And he, 
like you said, just targeted uh, all areas of the court, came up big, saved the set point in the second set, and just o- just owns that surface and owns that tournament. And really, I think bigger than that, Lee, this part of the year, he starts the ground running better than any tennis player that we've ever seen. Yeah, and, uh, you know, we talked about how the episodes that unfolded last year, how he would use that as fuel, use that as motivation. But that wasn't without a lot of pressure that you had to accept. And he, he handled that so well did get a lot of energy from being back in Australia. I mean, the crowds had turned out to support him. He had to feel good about that. Obviously, there were some incidents with his father. That had to be, you know, a bit of a a tricky episode to navigate, but I thought he handled it well. Yeah. And, you know, the the guy just plays such great tennis, obviously moves the ball around as well as anyone, but he has such great defensive skills and ability to protect the court, stay Mm -hmm. in rallies, not surrender too many of these short balls, like you said, maintaining depth and pace and position. So, um, you know, it was a classic Novak Djokovic lesson when it came to the yeah. clutch moments. And that's that's what he does best. And now poised at 22. I mean, this is going to unfold as a very exciting year, hoping Rafa can be healthy. He compartmentalizes better than just about any athlete that I've seen. You know, the good and the bad, he's able to just tuck it away. The stuff with his father you mentioned didn't let that get to him. Having that extra motivation where a lot of people would be upset, maybe a little on edge based on what happened, but he still was able to focus. Just remarkable stuff and a run that's insane. Like if we're talking the last four years, four and a half years, since the 2018 Roland Garros lost to Chechenado where he (laughs) and I'm not sure if I'm going to play grass after that. He's gone 10 out of the 16 majors he's played. He's won. Uh, That includes two more finals and then the loss with the disqualification in the U.S. Open and another U.S. Open loss where he retired against Stan via injury. So, I mean, it's 10 out of 16 wins, two more finals, two injuries. It's some of the best tennis he's played in a brilliant career and shows you why I think we can't take this for granted. Talking to John Wertheim last week, these are the crazy ones. This consistency (laughs) is not normal. We might never see it again. Yeah, and you know it's interesting because when he was coming up, when he was first making his initial breakthroughs, won the Australian, I think it was 2008, he was the younger of the two with Rafa and Roger. And he, you know, you had no idea that this was going to be a guy who was going to be pushing for the most Grand Slams of all time, particularly when those other two were around. And now, okay, yes, back then his, you know, sort of immaturity and that youthfulness didn't work in his advantage, but now it is here. He is on the verge of 23 and 24 and 25. And he's still looking like he's got years in the tank yeah. and with Roger gone Rafa. Well, we'll see how Rafa handles this season. Is this going to be his last? I don't know. We'll see. He's certainly been banged up a lot of late. And this is where suddenly Novak is going to be in the ascendancy in terms of majors and favorites and how high he could go. Could he go to 30? It's quite possible. It's, two or three, maybe four more years. I mean, he looks so good. Doesn't yeah. look like he's lost his step. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't see the two points I want to make here is I don't see a scenario now where he's not the greatest ever. Like it's, it's happening. Um, it would be really shocking if he didn't finish with more titles than Nadal. That's number one. Number two is while I agree that there doesn't look to be any slippage and 30 is a mythical number, maybe he gets there. He is 35. I know it's a, it's a young 35 and he looks great. And we've seen clips with athletes come out of nowhere, and then that's it. Now, I'm, I'm hoping it doesn't happen. I'm not predicting it happens, but that's something to consider is that, is that if something does go wrong, it could lead to, you know, the rest falling down because he isn't as young. But I'm, take, I'm not taking any of this for granted. Leaf. He's a remarkable player, and to watch him continually widen the gap with the field is the, is the craziest thing at this age. Yeah, and now the other side of the coin with that is he's had to play the last couple of Australian Opens with injuries. Didn't he have the abdominal yeah. injury before the pandemic? And then this, he had the, what, the three-centimeter tear in his hamstring that he had to manage. So he's also dealing with some, you know, sort of nicks and cuts. And yeah. these can be difficult for guys at 35, not only to heal from, obviously, as a luxury of, you know, picking and choosing when he wants to play, but you know, he's also facing challenges uh, from father time. So that's going to be part of the story for sure. Back at number one in the world, hasn't been allowed to play a a full slate, just remarkable stuff, a different species as his coach, Gorni Vinicevic said. (laughs) Uh, The other finalist, Stefano Tsitsipas, the second major final loses to Djokovic in both of them. I mentioned that I thought he played Leaf a pretty good match. There's stuff to learn on and expand upon. And obviously he's got you know, a, a little bit more to go, not much more to go, but to get to that major champion level, the positive for me would be 
you know, the semifinal and maybe the run to this tournament, Leaf, he kind of locked in mentally. There were some in that semifinal match, there were some calls against him, time violations, foot faults. He had a, a rocky end where he blew the third set of what would have been a straight sets win, but he dug back in. So for me, I'm like, this is a new phase of Sitsipas and something that will help him down the road for sure. Yeah. And, and it also happened on a hard court. You know, obviously, I think he's got proven credentials on clay with the Masters 1000 titles in Monte Carlo and the success at Roland Garros. But now on a hard court, is he getting his footing? I still think, you know, you know, Novak, the 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 guy standing at the door, not allowing him to get through. He looks at him as sort of a Roger Federer type player. I've got to get to the backhand to get to the forehand to get back to the back. And I just I feel like at times his backhand doesn't have the penetration it needs, although it's certainly an improved shot. But it's got to be great for him. You know, he was so sort of calm and he handled the presser well after the loss. He said, hey, this is what we want. We want to learn from these guys. We want to be as good and as great as these guys are. So I thought he handled it in a very classy way. And he's right. He's got to figure out how to get through these guys. Wasn't it Murat Safin who said, you know, when are these young guys going to start taking out these older established guys in, ter in terms of Rafa, I think Rafa is getting nicked up a bit on the hard courts mm -hmm. and the grass. Novak is sort of the last man standing of the big three, but these young guys are going to start making breakthroughs. And I think it's going to happen this year. We'll see. Up to number three in the world. Uh, this is the year he'll turn 25. So still a lot of tennis in front of him and yeah, showing it on clay and now on hard court is great. We'll see what Sitsipas's year is like. Wanted to talk about the Americans as well. We, the fact that, there was Tommy Paul, an American semifinalist. And while the top two ranked Americans and Taylor Fritz and Francis Tiafo didn't play to their capabilities this tournament, a lot of other players did. So this was the movement that as a whole American tennis like to see. We'll see what the next steps, what the ceilings are for these players. But outside of Djokovic's dominant win, I think the second storyline might be American tennis making a move on the global scale. Yeah. And, you know, we've got so many guys in the top 50 to choose from. and the fact that so many of them have made breakthroughs, winning titles, and sort of setting the stage for these big runs. You know, Tommy Paul got his first title a couple of years ago. I know, you know, Nakashima and Cressy have won titles now, and Tiafo has got a title. I think having made that initial breakthrough, it's going to make it a little more believable in their minds that they can make these runs. Like we saw that from Francis in New York. So, uh, you know, you could pick them really i mean taylor fritz obviously the top 10 man he's the top american you feel he's ready for a deep run at a major and he's obviously been knocking on the door at wimbledon so uh i i think it's going to happen sooner than we expect i think one of them is going to have another major breakthrough like tommy had i feel like that was as good as tommy can do with the guns he has one thing i think that's interesting about the american guys emerging is we talk about how coaching matters and tactics matters, but and also how your game develops. I mean, you have to come in to be an elite player and you have to have consistent weapons. And I think we're starting to see that from Tiafo and Paul, particularly on their forehand, Tiafo with his serve, definitely. Um, I was looking at Tommy Paul, he had what, 65 winners off the forehand wing in that run in Melbourne. It's nice to see him emerging as a bit of a player with a weapon from the back of the court. Otherwise, he was a bit of a grinder. Yeah. And Tiafo is serving bigger and better than ever. And he's not making the errors he used to make on the forehand wing. So both these guys making big runs with dependable weapons. I think that's one of the keys to getting sort of in the key in the door to the top 10 and staying there. You know, you look at guys like Andre Rublev, <laughs> dependable weapons, right? I mean, yeah. he, he's going to be around top five. Of all the guys in the top 10, I feel like those guys in that top five, like Rublev, like um, Tsitsipas, these guys who are dependable with their game, they're going to stay. And uh, the more you can sort of develop that in your game, you're going to be able to stick around. Yeah, Corda had the run, unfortunately, with the wrist injury. Brooksby, another one, and Ben Shelton, who I want to touch on in a second. But there's another added thing to this that I think is good. The top spots for these Americans aren't guaranteed. You know, Taylor Fritz has had a great run. Two back-to-back -back disappointing outcomes at hardcore at the last two majors. Tiafo would have liked to do better. Still plenty of time, obviously, but their spot's not secure. And I love that, that there's not, like, these aren't just going to be the guys guaranteed. You have Corey, you have Brooksby, Shelton, Tommy Paul, a few others. They're going to yeah, hold each other and they're going to have to hold their weight because the, the, the steam train is going to keep on rolling. 
<laughs> and this is what I think you know, U.S. tennis needs. This is what the men's tour and the women's tour has, that competitive friction at the very top of the game. These Americans, as Tommy Paul said, you know, they saw what Francis did in New York. Oh, well, we can do that. And Taylor Fritz winning Indian Wells. Oh, I think this is something I can do, too. So this kind of thing is really good for everyone. And you mentioned Ben Shelton, obviously. I mean, this is another guy. Boy, his serve, big forehand. It looks pretty dependable in my eyes when I see him play. He's making those shots pretty regularly. So yeah. you see that quarterfinal run was not a bluff. So, and uh, he looks good. And obviously, Korda, yeah. I think he's adding a little more firepower, better serving, and a little more consistent play on the forehand, too. So as far as Ben Shelton goes, and I wanted to ask you this as someone that played American college tennis in the Ivy League, you know, but you make that transition. Shelton, as we know, the weapons, the flair, love it. There is room to improve. He seems committed to doing it. We love to see that. But when you start to become a pro and then you get that first initial run and, you know, the first couple months, Ben Shelton has been on fire. There's going to be walls in a pro career. There's going to be slumps. Do you, do you feel like that, that, you know, is an inevitability that you just have to be, you have to have the mindset to adjust and roll with the punches that there is the inevitable come down after some early success. I, I find it very fascinating, not just pros that are college players, but you know, juniors that go to pro, they might have some success early, but they've been dominant tennis players their whole life. And they're not used to, for lack of a better term, just getting beat every week. So you think that's a mental block that Ben Shelt will have to live with and, and deal with and then eventually overcome. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, that's part of being a professional. I mean, momentum is such a powerful force in sports and now he's on the top of the wave right now and he rode it beautifully in Melbourne. I think he's going to continue to ride this wave. He's going to be primarily on, on hard courts, you know, his favorite surface. And this is, it's hugely valuable for him to capitalize now when he's hot because the inevitable dips, the wave crashing on the shore, it's going to happen. You know, you're going to have a couple consecutive losses. How do you deal with it? You know, he's got a good man in his corner, his coach. His dad is a former pro, so he understands, you know, sort of the vicissitudes uh, and the unpredictable nature of pro tennis. So he's got good guys and, you know, family around him. So I think he's going to handle it well. But those moments will come and um, he's going to have to, it'll be tested, no doubt. His mental capacity for it, can he stay confident, be himself, play through those tough moments? Because now he's got a bit of a target on his back. And, uh, you know, he's suddenly a good win. Is he top 50 now? Yeah, he is. It's insane. <laughs> More with Leif Shivers here on Tennis Channel Inside In. Before we turn our attention to the women, uh, just the rest of kind of the pecking order right now in the ATP off of Novak's win, he's number one. Alcaraz didn't play. He's two. Kyrgios is that wild card coming. Medvedev is a little down. Rublev, another run to the quarterfinals. The list goes on. But we're starting to see, you know, the 2023 season shape up and and i'll ask you what are you looking forward to as we get going here Do, dubai acapulco into the sunshine double what are you excited to see on the men's side well you know we mentioned how the top five looks pretty secure you know those guys have good results they seem to have the kind of tennis and game that's consistently you know going to put them there i think from anywhere now from six to twenty there are a lot of guys who would like to be in the top ten consistently now rafael Nadal at number six his health is a question. He won Acapulco finals of Indian Wells last year. So he's got a fair amount of points on the computer. He could drop outside the top 10. I think it's the first time, could be the first time in what, 900 weeks, something yeah. incredible like that. So his run of success is going to be challenged in this next couple of months. Um, the, the rest of the guys, I mean, there could be a fair amount of movement there. I mean, look at Yannick Sinner. Finished 21 inside the top 10. He's, what, 17, 18. Kyrgios is 20. Uh, Daniel Medvedev, he was inside the top 10 for three and a half years. He's 12, you know. So you've got a lot of guys who are familiar with the top 10. Can they get back there? Can they be there? Can they sort of stay there? It's, it's so tough now, the way the points are, how competitive it is. And uh, it's going to be an exciting season. I don't know what to tell you. I think it's a popcorn season. <laughs> Alcaraz coming back and and... If he can get another crack at Djokovic, we know that match last year on clay was uh, incredible, but he lost his number one ranking, wasn't able to play Australia. He's someone I'm looking forward to seeing. And uh, just like you said, how the pieces shake out. So a lot to discuss on the men's side. Can't wait to see where it goes. Turning our attention to the women. The Australian Open final was one of the better women's matches I've seen in women or men match in a very long time with Sabalenka taking out Rabakina, getting her first major title, overcoming the pressure, the service yips, 
a lot of issues that have plagued her in the past. And Leaf, she earned it. She hit tons of winners. She served away. She was down a set. It was a remarkable match. Rubakina gave her everything she can handle. Power tennis to the T. And then here we are, Rina Sabalenka as the major champion. I would still say it feels right because she has looked like a major champion outside of some of the biggest moments. The game's been there. The mind followed. And uh, hats off to Rina Sabalenka. Yeah, and it's it was a great performance. So much fun to watch because she seems like such a likable person. You know, I've I've interviewed her in the past, and and she's a great personality, great for the tour. And I think she, you know, her game was there. So the talents were, but I think her belief in herself and her capacity for you know handling pressure, finding her best tennis that was always the challenge for her. Amazing that she was able to overcome the serve yips because that that's like getting the yips in golf or. I, you know, or a guy who can't throw from second base to first. I mean, that can derail careers. We saw Guillermo Coria struggle, the Argentine, many years ago with his serve, and he just had ultimately forced him out of the game, really. So, you know, these are, you know, dramatic things she had to face. And again, great coaching helped her get it back mm -hmm. and belief in the coaching. There was a real sort of symmetry, symmetry there between the two. And um, I, I was so impressed with the game. And now when you see her, I mean, what are the weaknesses? <laughs> she looks so good, plays with power. The return sort of, I don't know, was it Mary Carrillo who said big babe tennis? You know, a lot of tall athletic players who yeah. can hit you off the court. So this is going to be a nice time for Iga Svantec to respond to all these new yeah. up-and-coming sort of established stars. So there was a symmetry in her. She was 0 for 3 in the, in the major semi she made, and she lost every third set 6-4. So she was right there, physically right there. Winning that semifinal match, it was Magdalene that winning that match, not winning this major. I mean, I could see kind of the dam being open now. Like this was the block that kind of got in her way. It would not surprise me if she went on a little run here. I don't know that I'd predict like major after major, but I don't think she'll be one and done. Like we were saying, there's not a lot of weaknesses. There's not a lot of holes to her game. And, you know, as, as we talk about the service ships, when the serve's on, it's one of the best serves in women's tennis. So it's not like, it's just a struggle getting it over the net and then winning the point. She's, she's locked in. The other point that I wanted to bring up is it was so refreshing to hear her talk about the issues and say, I kind of had to handle this on my own. My coaches were, you know, working with me, but they were, you know, frustrated. I was frustrated, but she said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to handle this on my own. And there's something about just looking in the mirror, looking in your locker room and clean and figuring it out that stuck with me as well. Yeah, and I, she spoke at length about that, how she was working with a sports psychologist, and that didn't seem to be getting the kind of things she wanted out of it. The coaching staff who, you know, at one point they said, I'm not sure we can help you anymore. Yet she said, no, I think we can do this together. Let's figure this out. So they, they stuck at it and kept at it. And that's, again, coaching is significantly important, particularly at this elite level. Everyone's looking for that edge, and she's found it. And that belief now is so strong in her. You feel like, you're right. This, why wouldn't she be able to play well at Wimbledon now that she can serve and depend on getting a few free points here and there? My gosh. And protecting the second serve. Yeah. That's one thing that a number of the players on the women's tour, that second serve can be such an important part of the game. And the bigger, stronger servers can really take advantage of that. If they're holding their serve comfortably, they can be more aggressive and more freewheeling on their opponents first and second. So it bodes well. I mean, I was so impressed with Rubakina as well. I mean, she's been floating in this sort of space, having won Wimbledon, but she would never sort of got the accolades and the acknowledge of, for that. No. I think there was a fair amount of pressure on her too. I thought she handled it well, played a yeah. really good final. So, I mean, they're both, I mean, this was a top 10, should have been probably top five matchup, given if the Wimbledon points, a whole other issue. But yeah, Rubakina was on court 13 to start this tournament. So that was the level <laughs> of respect at the beginning. But she looks like a bona fide player that's here to stay. Beat Iga in straight sets to get this way. You know, there, there was very little fluky about her run Azarenka in the semis. And it wasn't like she played a bad match either. It was just Sabalenka elevating down the stretch. I actually like Rabakina's style leaf too. It's a little, I don't want to say nonchalant, but it looks like it's kind of easy power. Her movement might not be the fastest, but she gets to where she needs to be. It's, uh, it kind of looks effortless for her. We know she's working hard, obviously, but Rabakina, you know, this is exactly, you know, to, truth be told, this is exactly what I think the game needed was two rising stars that seem like they're going to be a factor in second weeks of slams from here to come. Yeah, and and it is kind of a nice contrast. She does play flatter at a little more earlier on the ground. 
Um, I think, again, consistency was a factor for her, but she seemed to find that in Australia. And you wonder, has she made a step forward? I think perhaps she has, because that was a pretty good run she had. I mean, she would beat Daniel Collins, and she beat Ostapenko, and she had a really nice run. Obviously, the win over Shantek and Azarenka in the semis. I mean, those are good, solid wins. Did she beat Bencic as well? No, uh, she, just Collins, but play, played so well, and I... I don't know. I just feel like she's also in a good place because her serve is very dependable looking. So um, you got to like her game and her chances. Emily is Sable as well. So I think she's going to be a factor with that game on grass. That might not be the only Wimbledon title she has. A lot to like in that regard. Uh, for the rest of the players in this tournament, we talked last week about maybe the lack of uh, seizing the moment by some players that had chances here. I think the, I think the interesting thing with Iga Sviantek is that this loss to Rabakina isn't a bad loss by any stretch, but I feel like she might be chasing last year's near perfect run. And that's going to be the added pressure. Maybe not even, maybe even more pressure if that's possible than being number one is the fact that she had this dream year last year where she was untouchable. And now the competition's stepping up a little bit. Yeah. And for her to maintain focus on just her game and her performance each day, I mean, she can't look at what she has to defend in front of her because that would be so imposing. I mean, she won so many titles last year that those are going to back up against her. And if she has some you know, struggles, those points are going to come off pretty heavily. So there will be some pressure on her to perform. And this is going to be a test for her. And all of her mental strength is going to be tested in a different way than when she was running in front of the pack. Mm -hmm. Now she's, uh, you know, having to defend a lot of great results. Yeah. I, I still think on clay, she's a gear above. That's like her. I mean, no one's ever Rafa, obviously it's, it's a false equivalency, but she's clearly got an, an extra edge on the opponents on clay. So that's where, that's where I expect her to be at her best against the field, but we'll see what happens. Uh, the American women were, were no slouches at all. The last couple of years wasn't their best performance, but you feel like Coco, you feel like Jessica Pagula, they're knocking on the door. They're trying to kind of scratch through disappointments there, but we'll see how they rebound going forward. So the American women haven't won a grand slam since Sophia Kennan, which was not that long ago, but still the depth there is uh, building and bubbling to the surface. Yeah. And I, you know, Pagula and golf, obviously the two top tenors, we've got four in the top 35, I think it is. Um, and Madison Keys, she's capable of making a run, as is uh, Amanda Anasimova. I think she's sort of trying to find her feet, find that confidence again with her great ball striking. But uh, Coco looks so good in her tennis. You know, I, I just don't think in that loss that she was able to find her best tennis. Um, Pagula, it, Jessica seems to have the kind of tennis that always is going to be in the second week. You know, and now that she's break through, broken through and won, you know, a, a major event I've, in in the uh, 1000 category. I feel like she's got a shot to uh, also because of her consistency, be around in that second week and make a breakthrough. So I think the question is, you know, sort of when it'll happen, not will it happen? So if I'd have to ask you right now, how many different major champions are there? Are we going to have four women win majors this year? Does Ego win a couple? <laughs> Does that one can get another one? Well, I think, what is it? Is it 18 active Grand Slam champions on the women's side? I mean, it's something like maybe 17 now. I, I don't know if Angelique Kerber is still active and, and uh, Venus is still active, but um, there's there are a lot of players who've broken through in one, you know, can Saba or, you know, Rybakina win a second. It's it's very possible. Uh, I don't. I want to see some more first-timers, though. I think yeah. that's what's going to happen. Although someone's going to have to be Shantek on clay at Roland Garros. Yeah, that's the hard one, and and I think it makes sense why the U.S. Open has kind of opened up because the end of a long year, you get you get some fatigue at the top. Interesting stuff. Leif Shires here on Tennis Channel Inside In. Before we wrap this up, uh, just a couple quick things. Uh, tennis calendar rolls along. There's no stop in the train, and uh, <laughs> the women are the women are playing in Thailand and France right now in uh, Hua Hin and uh, Leon. Uh, and I don't know if you saw the the match yesterday. It was Kiki Maldenovic lost a a tough one, but she lost a match point where it was a terrible call and they don't have electronic lines people. So it's, it's, you know, another thing. And I know like we've adjusted to the times. I know you were in the old era where that wasn't the case, but I kind of, from the outside, I have to scratch my head and, and ask, why are we still, why is this still a thing? Why is this still happening? You know, I'm sure that's a financial consideration, you know, just to install that. But, uh, you know, does the French Tennis Federation have the funds to make that happen at these lower level events? You'd think that they would. 
Um, Cause it's tough living without line call help and assistance mm-hmm. these days. Cause everyone's hitting the ball bigger than ever. And you know, everyone's playing with these small margins. So, you know, you don't want matches to swing the wrong way because of these kinds of incidents. And I, I feel bad for Kiki because I saw that result. It was probably the best match in the first round there in Lyon, but uh, she's had some tough times. I feel bad for, her. but you know, yeah. why don't we have that at every event? You know, know, that should be a regular installation in every WTA and ATP event. And I understand some of these two fifties, so there are financial considerations, but um you know, maybe they sh- should have the tour should help these events out somehow so they can have that kind of technology. Yeah, everybody except Ostapenko wants it. So we got <laughs> <we gotta just laughs> it. I've never seen anything like it. But then again, I've never, you know, seen anything like Ostapenko's personality out there. Uh, the other tournament in Thailand, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit and get your thoughts. One of the bigger names there, if not the biggest, Bianca Andrescu playing the event has been pretty open about her lofty goals. Still wants to be a Grand Slam champion, top 10, Masters, 1,000, you name it. But she also said, look, I'm trying to play my first full pro season, which is startling to think about that she is not, with all the success she's had, and unfortunately all the injuries, played a full season. So where do you gauge the Canadian? Where do you gauge Bianca Andreescu's game right now and her goals and the chances that 2023 goes a lot better than last year did for her? Yeah, and I watched some of her first round match in Thailand and she looked good, you know, plays with that wonderful variety, pace on the forehand. I mean, if she's getting a high percentage of first serve, she's not as vulnerable on the second. I think she's got, again, tremendous upside. It's all ahead of her. The question is always going to be, is she going to be healthy enough? And is she going to be mentally clean and clear? You know, I think she's got a great head right. And if her body's right, no reason she can't be back in the top 10. She's that talented, that good. Yeah, I think the game and how she plays and her style and what she can do in terms of being a disruptor out there gives her an advantage. She's very, very game in, in big matches. We've seen it time and time again, but it's can the body hold up? And it's an unfortunate yeah. thing to ask for someone that young, but it's fair to have your doubts because it's not just one injury. It's not just a fluke thing. It's different parts of the body, and it's unfortunately been a thing. But But I'm with you. I mean, she's good for the game in terms of her different style, what she brings, and the fact that she really can beat anybody in the world, I believe, when she's having her day. Yeah, tenacious competitor. She has all the qualities of a champion. You know, she just has to be afforded the health and the clear-mindedness to allow it to happen. And she can make it happen. She's been there before. I mean, her performance in New York winning the Open was, I mean, I was stunned. I'm thinking, how does how is she able to play so well under so much pressure? So she can handle the moment. It's just she's got to put herself in a comfortable place. And uh, the Maple Leaf will be back on top. I mean, it's a golden era of Canadian tennis. I mean, Canada has never seen the kind of performances on the men's and the women's side. It'd be nice to see her back there. She's a very popular player. Um, she leads a lot of the media in Canada. I have a Canadian wife, so I see her a lot. So, um, you know, let's uh, wish her the best. I hope she can have a fine season. There's that Canadian side and you're popping out <laughs> it's only a matter of time. Uh, Leaf, la- last thing in the news that broke yesterday was Jensen Brooksby's parting with his coach, Joseph Gilbert. Interesting because Brooksby had the run beats number two at the time, Casper Rude, you know, biggest result in the grand slam, biggest match win he's ever had. Gilbert's the guy that kind of brought him up in the tennis world from a kid, literally to this point, built up his unique game, but partnerships run to an end and it doesn't appear to be personal that we've heard. So I think it's a, a fast thing, timing, number one. But number two, I think it's a pretty attractive, maybe maybe hard work, but it's a very attractive job to coach this guy with this potential at this point in his career. Yeah, no doubt. He's a super talented guy. You know, it's interesting. You know, Joe Gilbert was coaching his mom and dad, and his parents said, hey, can you take a look at our son? And that was the start of a long-term coaching relationship that was incredibly successful. They, they made wonderful strides together. As in relationships like this, things can change. The ideas, maybe he wants to hear a different voice, get some ideas. I mean, I think he has made some strides with his serve and a little bit of his, you know, racket work around the net. But generally, he still has so much upside. So maybe he wants a fresh voice. I'm sure that wasn't an easy decision to make, considering how close they were. But um, I feel like JT's got some real upside, man. He's, He's an awkward player to play against. He's improving his weaknesses. His serve was a bit of a weakness and it looked better in Australia. So I'm hopeful for him to have an also a good season. 
Now you talk about a real disruptor. That's this guy. And he is not, <laughs> not afraid to go. I, I, I noticed the improvements. That's, that's a good point. It was, it was little things that he got better at. And I think propelled him in a lot of these matches. So still, still time to grow. Still another American pushing his way through. Uh, it should be exciting. Leaf yeah, it'll be curious yeah. to see what he does in terms of which coach he will go to. Yeah. Does he want to go with the traditional coach? Will he go with someone who's tested? I mean, I feel like experience matters a lot in coaching on the tour. I mean, look at what Brad Stein has done for Tommy Paul. I mean, Stein's been around a long time and he knows the ins and outs, the ups and downs of the tour. You know, maybe it's time for JT to get someone who has that kind of experience if there's someone available at this awkward time where, you know, a lot of relationships have already started. They're fresh. They're yep. just getting underway. So maybe a tough time to start looking for a coach. Yeah, top three ranked Americans coached by, you know, Anna Cohn Russell, Ferreira, Stein. I don't think that's a coincidence. So I think that's <laughs> uh, Leif Showers, this was a blast. Always a pleasure talking tennis with the former player. I know times are tough in, in, in Chicago Blackhawk land. So you've Ooh, yeah. the Maple Leafs full time for the year. <laughs> yeah, I'm going more with the Maple Leafs now, although Austin Matthews is out. So I don't know. Three weeks on the sidelines, but I guess he missed out on the All Star game. But hey, I'm going to go back to tennis now. I got to get back in. You got to, you got to, but always a pleasure <laughs> talking tennis with you. Appreciate you coming on Tennis Channel Inside In. All right. Thanks for having me.